Okay, so you just looked at the generalities of beetles. Now I'm going to talk about those families and those individual species to some extent, at least the genera, of things that we're going to see on dead bodies. Remember that I went through those eight families that are, are most likely to be out and about. Two thirds of all the world's beetles fall into those eight different families. You're going to see some of those families on dead bodies. That's just the way you know, the law of averages basically works. The, uh, um, they're going to be there. So we're going to see a few of those. I will point out those species that are most common. All right, so speaking of that, let's start with Staphylinidae. Staphylinidae, remember, are one of those eight most common families, and Staphylinidae are commonly called the rove beetle. Rove beetles occur pretty much everywhere, all over the earth, uh, and both the adults and the larvae are predaceous. You will find them under rocks or logs. Uh, they will be in carrion and on dung. Uh, the reason that they are um, in uh, or on the uh, carrion is because they are feeding on the maggots and on other organisms that are on that body. So we will see them feeding on little first instar, especially those poor little maggots that have no defense system. They're going to be feeding on those. They're predaceous. So we'll see those running around. Now, uh, sometimes we will see the adults running around with their abdomen curled up and over their uh, thorax. This is a lot like uh, the way that we see, oh, the der der the dermoptera, remember the, uh, um, the earwigs or uh, beetles, or <laughs> earwig beetles, wow, really? The earwigs. Uh, running or the uh, um, scorpions, that sort of thing. So they will run like that. And this can freak some people out because it does remind them of scorpions. So they're not dangerous. I mean, these things aren't going to bite you or sting you in any way. And they're pretty small. I mean, look how tiny those things are. But there is one species that can cause an issue. We tend to see a, a wide variety of species running around on bodies because they are predaceous, uh, we don't necessarily use them as a, say, time of colonization thing. They have to come after the maggots are there. So that's pretty much all we know about them. They are pretty small. Uh, but some that do have this coloration, these bright colors. Usually when you see bright colors like this, remember that this advertises that these organisms might be dangerous. So one genus is the pader uh, Padaris. Is that how we're going to say it today? Sure. Uh, genus. So uh, this one has a toxin in its hemolymph called pederin. So this pederin will cause dermatitis in animals. So in this case, they don't shoot it out like the bombardier beetle. They don't do anything like that. It's more like the Spanish fly where it's just sitting in the hemolymph. And so if something eats it or squishes it or something like that, there's a toxin that can cause swelling or, of the dermis. So uh, skin reactions there. So uh, those can be a little iffy. So if you see one of these, you don't want to squish it on your skin because that can cause a bit of a chemical burn. But otherwise, they're completely innocuous. They're kind of fun to watch. They're going to be under things. Uh, I've seen bodies where you roll them over. There's just a whole mess of uh, rove beetles underneath there. Easiest way to tell the rove beetle from anything else, this big old uh, pronotum and these little stumpy elytra. So you can see most of its abdomen there. It has a variety of different antennae, but little teensy tiny elytra. All right, the next family are the sylphidae. Now, the sylphidae are commonly called the carrion beetle, the sexton beetle, or the burying beetle. So these are distributed worldwide, and this family has over 1,500 species uh, worldwide. So it's a pretty common species. And the reason it is called the carrion beetle is because the adults are often associated with the early stages of decomposition. They will usually arrive within the first 24 hours after death of an animal. So we do tend to see them on a regular basis. Now, the adults will feed on the eggs and the first instar larvae or the newly hatched larvae of flies that feed on carrion. 
So they show up very quickly and they're predators. Now the larvae are associated with later stages of decay and they actually feed on the carrion itself. So we have two different stages that will feed on different substrates. One is a predator in the adults, the other are actually saprophages. They're carrion feeders in the larvae. Now overall, sylphid beetles are medium to large in size and both the larvae and the adults are pretty easy to identify due to coloration and body form. Now, these are both sylphidy, but they look significantly different. So we do break them up into two major subfamilies. So when you see this I-N-A-E, remember that means subfamily. So we break them up into the sylphony and the nicrophorini. So this is based on the body form of the adult and the preferred habitat. So the sylphony. The sylphony tend to be found on large carcasses. They have uh, larvae that have a single ocellus on either side of the head, so just two simple eyes, and they are very, very heavily sclerotized. The adults have rounded elytra and a very prominent thorax, or prothorax. So this is typical of the sylphony. You can see this very prominent prothorax region, these rounded elytra. This is what the larvae look like. They look like flat armored maggots, basically, okay, but they've got six legs. They've got an obvious head capsule. So very, very dark in coloration for the most part. Okay. Now, uh, the nicrophorini, on the other hand, these tend to be found on small carcasses. This is very strange. I always thought this was weird because the nicrophorini tend to be much larger than the sylphony, but they're found, the smaller ones are found on the larger carcasses, while the larger ones are found on smaller carcasses. So these are the group that we often call burying beetles because what they do is the adults will grab these tiny carcasses and bury them in order to feed their larvae. So while they will show up on other carcasses in order to feed themselves on the maggots, they will take small carcasses. When I say small carcasses, I'm talking, you know, slugs and really tiny birds and things of that nature. So tiny, tiny carcasses. Uh, so they will bury those beetle, those carcasses and lay their eggs in that buried carcass, hence the name burying beetles. Now the larvae have a cluster of six ocelli on either side of their head, and they're sporadically sclerotized. So if you look at their sclerites here, they've got parts on the dorsal surface that are sort of sclerotized right in the center, but the rest are very squishy. They're not fully armored like the sylphony over here. Okay, so the adults also have this very large pronotum, uh, and they tend to have clubbed antennae, very obvious clubbed antennae. The elytra are shorter than the abdomen, so they don't cover the full abdomen. Notice in the sylphony, they fully cover the abdomen, unless they decide to stick out their butt right there. Okay, so major difference between the sylphony and the nicrophorini. And I bet you could write the quiz questions just on your own right now if you tried. All right. Scarabity. Of course, we're going to see scarabity in uh, bodies. Remember, this is another one of those eight major families. So the scarabity are um, the scarab beetles, and this is one of the largest beetle families. There's over 19,000 species that are described in scarabity. 1,400 of these are in North America. Now, the adults tend to be these robust beetles with a convex back and an elongate abdomen. So they have these sort of just round beetly backs. So I mean, really, these are what you think of when you think of beetles, these scarab beetles. Uh, the larvae are large and C-shaped with obvious head capsules and legs. So people tend to call these grubs. So anytime you see a big old C-shaped beetle larvae with legs and this obvious head capsule, it's a scarab larvae. Okay, so scarab larvae C-shaped and they just beetly looking beetles. Now, the ecology of scarabity, highly variable, because of course it is. They're extremely diverse. There's so many of them, so they're going to be all over the place. Some of these scarabs will live on fungi, some on flowers, on fruits, plants, in the nests of animals, but the majority live on dung, on carrion, and on decomposing plant materials. So a lot of them are decomposers. The adults in general are brown or black, but there are some really nice brightly colored species like we see here. These are so pretty. These are my favorite scarabs. They're just so beautiful. All right, now, a large group in this family 
are called the dung beetles, or they're called the tumblebugs. So the dung beetles or the tumblebugs, these are uh, these beetles that will feed on and feed their larvae on balls of dung, on balls of poop. So what they do is the adults will gather animal feces into these balls and they roll these balls um, following the sun and they will bury the ball to protect the young. So they're going to lay an egg in the ball of dung, bury that ball, and then the larvae are going to feed on this until pupation. So these are the brightly colored dung beetles. These are the ones that we actually have here in Texas. And they're really neat. This is the male. It's got this big old, like, oh, what is that, a spike or a horn on its prothoracic region. Its head is sort of tucked underneath. This is the female. doesn't have that spike. And so they, they'll... Um, wander through cow pastures and these beetles you can actually see them shining in these cow pastures so you're just driving by it's all bright and sunny out and they just the the light will glint off of these beetles and these beetles are attracted to farts this is an amazing thing these beetles man nature so what will happen is when a, a cow uh leaves a cow patty, it's going to release some gas, it's going to fart, and these beetles are going to come running because that means there is fresh dung in the in the uh, field. And so these beetles are an important part of this ecosystem. They clean up this the, these cow patties, they roll them into balls, and then they bury them in the soil. So they're putting all those nutrients in the soil, they're aerating the soil, they're helping the plants. They're, it's basically the best form of fertilizer. Now, there's a really awesome story. I'm not sure if I've told it to you before. I teach these classes a lot, but uh, regardless, I'm going to tell you anyhow. So there's this big story about dung beetles in Australia. So dung beetles have evolved with large animals that produce a lot of dung, uh, especially things like cattle, right, or big ruminants. They didn't have cattle in Australia until we um, colonized down there. The original peoples of Australia, they're, they're not a, a, an endemic species. They're not a natural species down there. So they didn't rear them down there until, say, Europeans colonized Australia and they brought with them cows. This became an issue because cows eat a lot and then they poop out a lot. And there was nothing there to take care of all of those cow patties. So... People are, you know, rearing cattle and there's nothing taking care of the dung, nothing aerating the soil. No, there was a lot of problems with this. So the government actually said, OK, we got to figure out how to how to fix this problem. So they found out about these dung beetles, got some entomologists involved. They imported a whole bunch of dung beetles and they found that uh, they took care of those cow patties just really, really quickly, because that's what they do. So they did that. Wonderful. Now, Australia is brutal. And so there were frogs down in Australia that found or figured out that they're these big old juicy beetles now. I mean, look how big and juicy these dung beetles are. And so imagine all these dung beetles rolling around. They don't have a lot of protection. They don't produce a lot of really nasty substances. They're not really spiky. They can't fight back. So these frogs are now... Uh, figuring out that these big juicy beetles around that don't know how to fight anything off. So the frogs would hang out by cows and wait for them to poop. And then these big juicy beetles would come to them and the frogs would eat the beetles. So then the problem came back. So now we've got cow patties everywhere. There's these native frogs that are eating these imported beetles. That became an issue. So the government again went to entomologists and they went and found a really crazy strong rhinoceros beetle. These beetles have really, really thick exoskeletons. So, and they have big spikes and they can burrow their way out of places. They're even bigger than these dung beetles. So they brought those in. And as these uh, frogs saw these big beetles, they went after them, they would eat them. The beetles wouldn't be digested because of their exoskeleton. They would just burrow their way out of the frog's stomach, killing off these native frogs. So then, you know, nature in action. So now everything is in balance down there and nobody's knee deep in poop anymore. Fun story, scarabity. All right, clarity. Clarity is commonly known as the checkered beetle. Okay, the, there are approximately 25 or 3,500 species worldwide, and more than 400 occur in North America. So 3,500 species worldwide, 400 occur in North America. Most of the bodies of the uh, both the larvae and the adults are covered in these bristly hairs. So that is one of the easiest ways to recognize these things. So they got all, they're, they're hairy. I mean, look at the, how hairy those larvae are. They're, uh, the adults are often brightly colored, so they come in red, 
reds and oranges, that sort of uh, coloration. Uh, and they range from three to 12 millimeters in length in the adult stage. The head is often whiter than the pronotum. So this is an easy way, just rule of thumb, to be able to tell these species apart. Big head and the pronotum tends to be thinner, while the meso and the meso, uh, meta uh, notum are whiter as well. Okay, so this sort of gives this appearance of that constricted neck area of this beetle. Both the larvae and the adult stages are predaceous, and most of them will prey on immature stages of wood boring beetles, but a few species do feed on fly larvae. So they will visit decomposing animal matter in the later and drier stages of decomposition, and they will feed on whatever things happen to be there. So they can't handle a lot of liquid, so they're not there early, but they will feed on whatever things are left in the drier stages of decomp. The adults are often found on flowers nearby as well. So we will see these on bodies. All right, the hysterity. So the hysteridae are commonly known as the clown beetles, and they're just super round. That's one of the easiest ways to tell hysteridae from anything else, just super duper round. They have over 3,000 species worldwide, 500 of which are widely distributed throughout North America. And the adults are small. They seldom get over 10 millimeters in length, so they're not very big at all. And they are rounded, super round, and very shiny beetles. Primarily, they are black and shiny. Sometimes we'll see a shiny metallic green. If you look up close at the elytra, the elytra are short and squared, so they will expose these last two abdominal segments. So you get them very close to this rounded beetle, and then you can see basically their butt right there. Now these are very common on all decaying material, including carrion, excrement, fungi, and plant matter. We tend to see these beetles most active at night, and they prefer to stay concealed in the soil underneath the carrion during the daytime. So if you take soil samples, you'll likely find these. Both the larvae and the adults are predaceous, so they're gonna feed on maggots and fly puparia. Now, they have been observed feeding on larvae of other beetles as well, although usually beetle larvae are much more armored, much more protected than the fly maggots, so they're going to go for the fly maggots, that easier prey. All right, so that's the first grouping of the, um, the families, or forensically important families of beetle. Up next, we'll go over the last crew. Let me know if you have any questions.